In the fall, she will be attending Indiana University to pursue a PhD in folklore studies. How's that coming along, Katya? Are you, um, you've got your green card and everything? I am all ready to go. <laughs> oh, when are you leaving? Or when will you be leaving us? Not until the end of July. Oh, we still have you for a bit. <laughs> um, having had an opportunity to work with archival collections and cultural communities um, in her RHA position at the Cool Folklore Center and through many different work experiences. Uh, Kaita's experiences have influenced her research to focus on the ways in which communities create, preserve, and revitalize a variety of forms of material culture. With an emphasis on textile art, Katya is currently studying the role of material culture in trans transnational folklore, focusing on Ukraine and the Ukrainian Canadian diaspora. Her research interests include decolonization theories, material culture studies, folklore, women and gender studies, and post Soviet spaces. Thank you, Katya. Go ahead. And thank you, Slavka, for that introduction, and good evening, everybody, and thank you for attending today. Firstly, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that this ongoing research and today's presentation takes place on Treaty 6 territory, where we respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continue to enrich our vibrant community. With this, I would like to also acknowledge my position as a Ukrainian Canadian and as a settler scholar when analyzing trends within Indigenous folk art and Ukrainian, um, sorry, Indigenous folk art and the traditions. As such, my role is to be aware of my guesthood and to guard against generalizations between my experience and those of Indigenous people. I am not here this evening to make assumptions or generalizations about culture. Rather, I would like to discuss with you the ways in which these trends of appropriation and cultural assimilation have affected both the Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian global community and the Indigenous communities in colonial Canada. I believe that due to our complicated histories as Ukrainian settlers on Indigenous land, particularly within Alberta, and with the current turmoil that Ukraine faces in regards to identity, uh, which is a similar turmoil that exists within Indigenous communities, that there's an important conversation to be had surrounding the similarities in, and differences in materiality in today's respective political and social climates. By Looking at the communicative properties of Ukrainian embroidery in modern and traditional fashions and comparing these to the indigenous context in colonized North America, my research asserts that traditional folk art as presented in clothing is an effective vehicle of resistance against oppressive and colonial powers. Throughout the history of communication, symbols have been used to convey a variety of messages messages which require contextual and cultural understanding in order to be decoded. As one of the earliest forms of communicative media, clothing, textiles, and various forms of dress have been used and are continuing to be used as nonverbal communication. They present a social significance to the audience of their wearer. What we choose to wear is made up of a variety of different motivations, whether it's choosing to wear a tuxedo to signify a special occasion or a wed wedding ring to show marital status, maybe sweatpants as a choice of comfort or costumes for Halloween or traditional dress as a cultural signifier. When we choose what we wear, we dress to accommodate social and environmental factors and to reflect our personal aesthetics and identities. Dr. Pravina Shukla notes that, quote, sending meaningful messages through dress is one way people engage in daily artful endeavors, participating in what folklorists call creativity in everyday life or artistic communication in small groups, end quote. Additionally, clothing possesses two main functions, the open performative and the private personal. Maxim Krapovitz emphasizes that when we think of performance, we tend to focus on those the theatrical elements of what it means to entertain, but the attention to a specific aesthetic and emotional interaction between the, art the artist and the audience, sorry, is what is integral to all performance, and it's the same focus and interaction which inform informs displays of culture and identity through clothing. 
With clothing, however, the role of the artist is often removed, with that connection now being created with the wearer and their audience. The open performative nature of culture exists when the object in question displays a message to those who view it. This function makes traditional and modern interpretations of folk art, such as embroidery or beading on clothing, an ideal way to promote and reclaim identity. The second function, the private personal, focuses primarily on the use of clothing for protective purposes, both spiritual and physical or ritualistic purposes as well. For example, wearing an embroidery pattern such as uh, malo to ward off sickness in the Ukrainian culture or the use of spiritual inspiration to create beading patterns in Anishinaabe communities. With these two functions, um, they each have their own distinct purposes. However, they don't contradict or oppose one another, and they can often exist concurrently within folklore and material culture. Additionally, these functions act as motivators for those who choose to wear and create traditional or modernized cultural clothing. However, the key element to this conversation is choice. So how can we approach this creative and cultural medium when access has been restricted and meanings have been manipulated by colonizers and oppressors when no longer presented with the choice of what we can and can't wear, such as children being forced to wear uniforms to school or bans on traditional clothing, we are deprived of the ability to communicate our individuality and our culture. It is the tradition of shared meaning feeling and identity that is transmitted through dress that makes this form of material culture a primary target of appropriation and eradication during periods of colonization and identity crisis. During the Soviet era, clothing was changed drastically with the various Soviet socialist republics, including the Ukrainian SSR, following these changes. East European communist dress was not only born inside a reality burdened with post-war material poverty, but also inside a reality stripped of all previous clothing references. With the rejection of Western fashion during the Stalinist regime and the attempted eradication of cultural uniquities, clothing was forbidden from evoking beauty or elegance. Clothing was intended to be functional, simple, and classless in order to fulfill all the satorial needs of working men and women. This provides a stark contrast to what we think of today when we consider Ukrainian clothing. And so when we're thinking about those beautiful vishivanke, the embroidery, the hustke that we wear, we see a very different picture from what you see um, in Soviet style clothing. Now, in the Canadian context, from the 19th century until 1951, the Indian Act restricted Indigenous ceremonies, such as the potlatch and Sundance, consequently preventing the wearing of regalia that was typically worn at these events. Traditional dress was also forbidden in residential schools, and before the Indian Act was changed in 1951, Indigenous peoples required the permission of the Indian agent, a federal administrator of uh, Indigenous affairs, if they wanted to appear in ceremonial dress outside of their reserves. While these two examples are vastly different, they occur within similar timeframes and demonstrate different forms of oppression when it comes to clothing and textile art. Now, on the left of the screen, you can see an example of early Soviet era clothing. And on the right is two pictures of Thomas Moore, an indigenous child. The first was taken before tuition at Regina Indian Inter Industrial School, and the second was taken after tuition. Both of these photos are from 1897, and you can see the stark contrast between what he's wearing and uh, how his hair has been cut, uh, different things like that. Now, having made a resurgence in popularity during periods of political unrest, such as the Orange Revolution and the Yevromaidan Revolution of Dignity, traditional patterns of Ukrainian embroidery and Ukrainian style clothing has seen a shift in both the purpose and the meaning. 
With the increase in commercialization and global connectivity, diaspora communities are able to reconnect with the national Ukrainian culture and the changes that have occurred over time and across borders. When contemplating the role of embroidery in transnational Ukrainian culture, it is useful to consider the cultural psychology from, perspe from the perspective of Moisha Esteban Guitar and Karl Ratner, particularly the variety of existing social conditions that contribute to the ways in which macro culture is rooted in historical forces, such as government policy, wars, immigration, modes of production, technology, consumerism, and art, just to name a few. And just as macro cultural factors are political, formed through political struggle and impart their politics to psychological phenomenon, embroidery has seen its resurgence in popular culture as a political statement, resisting the Sovietization of identity that the country had undergone and continued attempts of russification prior to and following the collapse of the USSR. Whether intentionally or circumstantially, Ukrainian embroidery has adopted the role of artifacts within this macrocultural psychology transnationally. The craft acts as a, un a unifying factor beyond borders and as a signifier of culture and identity amongst Ukrainian nationals within the diaspora. As the macro culture of Ukrainian life continues to evolve into a more pronounced global identity, the accessibility of both modern and traditional embroidery solidifies its functionality as a transnational object. Now, with a variety of designers and artisans embracing the movement, along with the general public, there's been a significant increase in products available with these patterns, including high fashion, COVID-19 face masks, and glass or ceramic wear featuring decalcomania. Now, Indigenous designers from tribes including the Ojibwe, Navajo, Cree, Crow, and Kiowa are also working to create more inclusive and accessible modern iterations of traditional designs and patterns while putting the spotlight onto cultural activism and their grassroots movements. With the intention of reclaiming their heritage in a time when Indigenous people continue to remain invisible, Bethany Yellowtail, a prominent designer and activist, created versions of traditional wing dresses and skirts that were all inspired by notable Crow and Northern Cheyenne women who served in battle. Additionally, Yellowtail works with her community to promote and aid other Indigenous designers on her digital platform, B.Yellowtail. The online shop's slogan is, quote, Indigenous design for all. And that suggests the line between appreciation and appropriation may not be as tricky to navigate as many of those high-end designers have led us to believe. For Yellowtail, a key factor in appreciation versus appropriation is the support for the Indigenous communities from which these styles and designs come from. On the site, there's an emphasis of community and supporting the indig Indigenous economy while sharing the designs globally with people of any ethnic background. When considering how these designs can be used as a form of protest, Justine Woods, a Métis artist, actively uses Indigenous beading techniques in an effort of decolonization by embellishing traditionally Western men's tailoring, such as suits, as well as graduation regalia from Ryerson College with symbols of Métis culture. So adding that beading to the cuffs, the lapels, different areas on that traditionally Western male masculine clothing. Now, the conversation surrounding appropriation versus appreciation still continues today. And less than 19 hours ago, author Drew Hayden Taylor published the article, When it comes to, do to doning Indigenous fashion, aim for inspiration with the Globe and Mail. For many of the designers and the people within various Indigenous communities, the problem occurs when non-Indigenous people attempt to recreate um, different things from Indigenous cultures, whether that's clothing, music, etc. Now, in contrast to the highly exclusive events of Paris or New York Fashion Week, the Indigenous Fashion Week in Toronto is advertised as, quote, for everyone. 
and hosts will also work. Um, hosts will also present workshops um, and different lectures in order to teach the community more about Indigenous textile art and craft. Additionally, Vancouver Indigenous Sorry, Vancouver Indigenous Fashion Week's mission is to celebrate and make visible Indigenous art, as well as the culture, community, land-based wisdom, and global future, and to facilitate, facilitate an Indigenous ally relationship through collaboration, education, and representation. And so visual signifiers are not restricted to the same dimension as auditory linguistics insofar as they display signals with multidimensional form. Beadwork on regalia may represent temporality by hearkening back to past patterns with traditional meanings, with traditional meanings while simultaneously evolving with modern techniques and tools that show the continuation and future of the art form. It is up to the bead artist to ensure that the vision of the dancer or the wearer coincides with their identity. Additionally, colors and patterns are not merely an adornment. They should be intertwined with the identity and status uh, of the dancer or community member. And when an Anishinaabe artist beads regalia for themselves, they're instructed to use their spirit colors. So however, when fashion sort of became fetishized and there was the rise of the fetishized commodification in the 1900s, these traditional meanings were lost with mass production when the patterns and designs were copied without permission and sold for profit. Cultural appropriation is best understood as a manifestation of a power imbalance that is already present between the appropriator and the appropriated. And for Marx, appropriation is taking ownership of an object for his or her own use. One designer who has appropriated both Indigenous and Ukrainian cultures within the same year, and alongside many others, is Valentino. And in 2015, the high-end designer launched a fashion line that was allegedly, quote, inspired by Russian countryside, end quote when the embroidery was more closely resembling the national embroidery and dress styles of Ukraine, specifically designed after the Vishivanka, the Zhupan, which is a long uh, white coat typically decorated in embroidery, and the Kiptar, which is a sheepskin vest worn with the fur on the inside. And all three of these are elements of traditional Ukrainian costume. The claims of the style as Russian had not only insulted the national culture of Ukrainians, but it demonstrated the long-standing history of the colonial impression that Russia has attempted to deliver to the rest of the world, that Ukraine was a part of Russia, and this collection caused a particular uproar within the country, as within the previous year, Russia had illegally annexed Crimea from Ukraine, preventing the inclusion of Ukraine within the European Union, and continued to attempt to annex Donbass from Ukraine through warfare. With many examples of Ukrainian designers who are able to include traditional embroidery styles uh, and the use of communication in their collections, there was, little, there was very little tolerance within the country for the mistakes of this well-known high-end fashion designer. In contrast, designers such as Lena Ivanova, Olga Navratsky, and Vitaken are receiving national praise and recognition for their inclusion of traditional motifs and symbols of embroidery as a statement about the national identity of Ukrainians in response. This type of cultural appropriation where labels draw from deep rooted design codes without crediting the culture from which they're taking them is particularly harmful to indigenous people as well, who have been and continue to be marginalized. Later in that same year, Valentino worked to collaborate with Métis visual artist Christy Belcourt, seeking the appropriate information and producing a line that included Native American beading patterns and styles. However, while working to create these unique items, Belcourt was unaware that Valentino was also directly copying these patterns from traditional items such as antique Kiowa and Cheyenne moccasins. Dr. Jessica Metcalf 
questions the economic impact of these objects as well, considering how the artists and Native American communities and reservations feel about the Im economic impact of others selling um, these culturally decorated objects for the benefit and monetary gain of such a high-end fashion brand that clearly did not need the money that it was making off of these objects when it would be better donated to communities. It is unsettling to consider the use of appropriated culture for monetary gain when the designers even present their works as capturing an essence which they assert were present in such indigenous objects when the essence is not fully understood to them, nor could it ever be. While the shift towards decolonization in the 20th and 21st centuries it is important to note that the role of the colonizer within this process of shifting away from colonization. Peter Shand emphasizes that in 2002, one may observe that objects are being returned, ideologies are being respected, permission is being sought, just not enough and too infrequently. And he calls out designers and consumers alike and their ability to do more by holding themselves and each other accountable. In fact, the use of these traditional forms of folk art in fashion continues to reinforce the appropriation of culture, leaving the bitter taste of colonialism in the mouths of many. And so on the screen here, you can see two examples of from the, uh, the Russian inspired collection by Valentino, as well as one of the copied patterns that adorned the back of a backpack, um, having come from moccasins. Now, one object which I have intended to conduct research around but have been unable to due to the COVID-19 crisis is that of the Hustka or Kukum scarf. And when you Google search images for this well-known object, the two names are practically synonymous. You will receive the same images no matter which one you put in for the most part. Um, same as when you're trying to use a third party seller like Etsy, you will see artists that will advertise the same scarf as a Huska scarf or a Kukum scarf in order to reach different audiences. Now, this connection was first brought to my attention in 2019 while I was working at the Ukrainian Cultural Heritage Village. Out of character, I had the opportunity to speak uh, with a Cree woman who told me stories about her grandmother or Kukum who was wearing a scarf similar to the one that I had on my head that day. The following fall, I also connected with another student at the University of Alberta who told me about her heritage with her father being Ukrainian Canadian and her mother being Blackfoot. She jokingly told me that when she wore the scarf around the back of her shoulders, it was her baba shawl, but when she wrapped it around the front, she called it her kukum scarf. For Christmas in January that following year, I was gifted with a copy of Marian Mutala's um, Kukum's Babushka, which is a story about early contact between Indigenous people and Ukrainians in colonized Canada. This book is advertised as, quote, a tale about two diverse families and their first encounter with one another. It shows the beauty of the differences and similarities, particularly the generosity and reciprocity valued by each family's cultural tradition, end quote. In 2018, Tala Tutusis created the hashtag Cook'em Scarf campaign to increase awareness and empower women within Indigenous communities, asking women to photograph themselves in their ribbon skirts and Cook'em scarves. So what is the connection with this object and how does this scarf function in two separate cultures who have both faced a variety of forms of oppression? There's so much research to be done. And as a folklorist, I believe the best place to start with this would be ethnographically doing interviews within the communities. However, this means waiting until a time when we can all meet in person again in order to help keep these communities safe. I do believe that it is pertinent to note that traditional culture is seeing a resurgence from both of these communities both Ukrainian, Ukrainian diaspora, and Indigenous communities. And they're becoming more politically active and more interested in the traditions of their ancestors with young people learning Ukrainian embroidery as well as Indigenous beading techniques and having them become popular pastimes. 
the availability of these objects has increased substantially, stimulating their respective cultures, communities, and economies. Now, by creating the objects within their own communities, people are better able to connect with the tradition and the history that may have otherwise been lost, as well as that private personal function of uh, clothing, folk art, and craft. And as with the stories and the folklore surrounding these objects. I look forward to having the chance to continue to pursue this research and be able to provide more answers regarding the objects that I haven't been able to address today. Um, but I do look forward to being able to continue to share my knowledge that I have learnt in future presentations with you all. And I'd like to thank you for your time today. And if you have any questions, I will do my best to answer them. Thank you so much, uh, Katya. That was extremely interesting. Um, I just had one question. Um, it was when you were um, closer to the beginning. And Someone went asking about what was about the 19 hours ago. I think she cut out and wasn't sure what that was about. If you can remember, do you remember that? Yes, yeah, sorry, there was an article published 19 hours ago about um, different ways to avoid appropriation and what to do um, in order to show appreciation to indigenous uh, fashions, art, et cetera. And so that um, is just used as an emphasis to show that this is a very recent and ongoing conversation. Is there anyone else that would like to um, question or discuss or um, any kind of comments that you wish to put out there? It is interesting that both both the Indigenous and the Ukrainian uh, embroidery that it has reached out to other fashion and to modern fashion. And it's interesting about the misappro misappropriation of it. Um, I know that there have been, Versace I think also did one on uh, the Pesanke um, one, not so much the embroidery, but the Pesanke. So, um, I'm going to check to see if anybody has been brave enough to mention anything. Can I ask a question? Sure. It's Elaine. Hello, Katya. Uh, this was interesting for sure. Um, when you're talking about appropriation, um, you pointed out how it can be abused when they ignore the identity the 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 source of the the um, the uh, image what about simply whoever is captured by the aestheticness of the item do you know what i mean like they're not so interested in acknowledging you know the originators or whatever or what they represent but rather they're more taken with the the aestheticness of the item and they simply take it and they they want to use it in whatever fashion in other words is there not some some uh, importance to that aspect of utilizing these patterns and, and uh, traditions in modern dress. I don't Absolutely. know. I, I don't know if that makes much sense, but sometimes I'm thinking whether it's these Parisian designers or whatever, and maybe they misidentify the sources of these things, but they're taken with the aestheticness of it all. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think um, now within this day and age, we do have a strong responsibility as consumers and creators. Um, within the last, I believe it was 15 years, global clothing consumption has increased by 150%. And so that means that we are buying more, we are throwing away more, we are creating more. And it's our responsibility to understand where these patterns come from. And I firmly believe that as a textile artist myself, um, in the age of 
computers, we are very easily able to find out more information about these histories, as well as um, for these larger brand designers. We see with Valentino working with uh, smaller communities, as well as renowned people within these communities, uh, such as Christy Belcourt, um, that they're still not going the full 10 yards. They're kind of doing a half job of working with these communities when they still leave them out of important decisions and conversations. And I think it's very easy to, to recognize that these designers know that what they're doing is wrong, but they also have this, this sense where they feel almost untouchable. I know, um, I think specifically when I was a teenager, one of the biggest fashion trends was boho or bohemian fashion. And I thought to myself a lot, why does this $10 shirt resemble the $200 Ukrainian blouse that my mom gave me? Like, why are these fashions so similar? Who is benefiting off looking like me? And now there's this conversation where it is excellent to be able to access these things. But once you're starting to make a profit off of something that a community who is in need should be making that profit off of, I think that's where that conversation really needs to sort of start happening again and become a little more important. And again, like as consumers, as, as global citizens, it's definitely our responsibility to know what we're representing with what we wear and what we appreciate, um, whether it's art, clothing, etc. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> yes, it does very much. Yes, thank you. Um, Christine, as was that key, uh, Christine, do you want to just unmute and uh, please join in in the conversation? Essentially, uh, I, I just wanted to say, I, I mean, we are all aware that uh, people have been uh, influenced by fashions and other cultures in culinary arts and all sorts of things for centuries, and they have adopted fashions that appeal to them. Why all of a sudden has it become unacceptable? I think um, within the last, uh, I'd say about 100 years or so, we really, we've seen an uptake in accessibility to different different fashions, different cultures. And um, even looking back to Edward Said's Orientalism, we know that it was never truly acceptable to take these things from their home cultures without crediting them or by othering them as simply a commodity to be owned. You then kind of equate the people that go along with these objects that have created these objects as another commodity themselves. And so I think now it's becoming a more important conversation because we have the ability to access communities. Communities kind of have that ability to stand up for themselves and represent these objects. Um, if you tried to sell, make a, a global phenomenon out of Ukrainian embroidery during the Soviet period, I'm not sure it would have worked. But now during these political movements, it's definitely got a lot more traction. And you see a lot more people in diaspora wearing Ukrainian inspired things such as hockey jerseys and things that you traditionally wouldn't find with that embroidery on them. But because it's coming out of the Ukrainian community and it's being done in support of the community, I think that's really where uh, we notice kind of why this conversation is so important today. Now that we sort of have an answer of how can we still indulge in these objects that we really appreciate that may not belong to us, um, as opposed to just having that conversation that these objects don't belong to us, so we have to stay away from them. And I know within the last 10 years, it was generally that was the only thing that we didn't know how to navigate appropriation. We kind of, we were told you stay away from something that didn't belong to your culture. But now we're seeing these cultures come out and say, it's okay, so long as you're supporting the original source, you're supporting that culture not uh, a big fashion designer or a small um, like workshop brand that's uh, mass producing this culture without the knowledge and the history behind it. Thank you very much. Um, I, I just wanted to say, I know that when we have seen uh, a designer take our ideas, I thought I, I was kind of proud or I was impressed that somebody had actually noticed our culture, that it was 
uh, there that they were um, intrigued by it or inspired by it is probably more the best word for it. So I've never thought of it as being unacceptable to, to that. Um, I thought it was more of a compliment that our culture was actually now being recognized uh, rather than, than saying, hey, you can't do that, that's ours. So um, if you want to comment on that, Katya. Absolutely. Um, um, one thing that I've really noticed, especially in my current ongoing ethnographic research regarding COVID-19 face masks, is that coming from, especially within the Ukrainian Canadian diaspora, we're coming from a, a definitely a more privileged, privileged place where most of us here have never been told we can't express our culture. We, we are not allowed to wear these things. Um, we've maybe had a harder time accessing it all the way across the pond, but we've had these traditions kind of embedded into us. Our, our grandparents have brought over embroidery. We've created our own embroidery. And we've never really been told, you're not allowed to do this. Even during the Soviet period, embroidery was encouraged to kind of promote that, the idea of the peasant class or um, kind of like make, the Ukrainian culture appear quote unquote cute and simplistic. And so we've never really seen that same kind of oppression that indigenous people may have seen or the, that they have definitely seen when it comes to not being able to wear their traditional regalia. And that's why I, I definitely wanna caution anybody um, if you're taking anything away from this, I'm, I'm not trying to equate the two cultures. I'm just using them as examples. Um, as both that have occurred within the same time frame, um, And with my research that's going on right now, I've noticed a lot of Ukrainian participants, especially younger Canadian Ukrainian participants saying that they're very excited when they see people wearing examples of embroidery, whether they're Ukrainian or not. Um, what they want to see is that it's done respectfully. And I think where that conversation really, what we miss in that is within the indigenous community, a lot of the things that people are copying, such as headdresses or traditional beading patterns, is it's not being done respectfully. And I don't think that um, unless we are a part of that community, we never fully understand what that will feel like. I hope that answers your questions, Lauka. Yes, yes, uh, I think it does. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katya, for being part of the Threads That Connect. I wish you all the best in your endeavors for your PhD. Uh, that's so exciting. Um, Thank you. It's a little sad that you couldn't be able to do it here at the U of A, but uh, maybe we'll see you back uh, once, you, once you've completed it. I have another question for you. Can I just, <laughs> more to the point I was trying to make before, and I was quite clumsy in my uh, attempt to articulate it. And that is like, what if a person sees something and they don't know anything about it, but they love it for its aesthetic value, its visual aesthetic value. So they want to replicate it without knowing where it came from, what it represents, the ident uh, nothing, nothing of all of those things you talked about, about a, in particular identity. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I think. It's, I mean, is, again, is, it's, is that okay? Yeah. Just to take those things that, and try to replicate it, without knowing anything about it, or do you have to know? where it originated, what it represents, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I think um, when it comes to replications, so long as you're doing it for yourself, um, I think for me, at, like, again, as a textile artist, one of the big things for me is knowing why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, so if I'm creating the traditional, uh, rose pattern that we see on almost all Ukrainian embroidery has kind of been copied and pasted onto things because it was so popular. I also know that this pattern is not particularly meaningful and it's only received its meaning within the last 50 years as a commercialized pattern. And I think I feel a little bit better about myself when I'm recreating it. Um, 
But I think it's it's when you get to that point that you're creating it for monetary purposes. Um, I don't think copying a pattern is ever going to, it, it's going to get you in a lot of hot trouble unless you're actually doing it to share with everybody else. And then people start to see that maybe this didn't belong to you in the first place. It's, it's almost a conversation about intellectual property and what we own and what we do with it. And I think there's a lot more laws now governing intellectual property and we're a lot more clear on what we can do with the things we post online because once it's online it never actually goes away no matter how hard we try to delete it it's always saved somewhere so i think um just even with the creation of the internet we we are a lot more aware of our intellectual pro property being out there and so long as we're doing so respectfully for ourselves well but I, th I think you're speaking to um, commercialization as opposed to just a personal admiration of of a design or an item, and and I think you know jewelry, um, you know might might be a good example, or that's what I'm identifying with. Like, um, and but I mean the sad part about this is that I have some beautiful beautiful jewelry made by First Nations people, and I can't wear it. See, I think I'm, not, I'm not selling it, you know, I mean, that's, and that's, that's what I have to say, I feel very, very sad about and I bought it because I loved it. And, and I wanted to support the artist and, and I feel that I can't put it on. Why, why can't you wear it? Because of this very issue that we're talking about right now. See, because I, think I, feel, that... I feel that someone will accuse me of appropriating someone else's culture. And, and, and I, and I worry about that. And, and, and that's where I think this is a really important discussion to have, but it is sad. It's a really, really sad state, you know, because I, I really don't, I don't think that the artist would ever, um, like it assert that you're appropriating their culture. I, there's definitely a difference between buying beautiful indigenous beading or turquoise jewelry from the source versus buying knockoff turquoise jewelry from uh, like Susie Shear or somewhere, you know, uh, but I think as consumers, so long as we're buying them in the correct places and we know that where these have been sourced from, you bought it to support an artist, the best way to, to support them is to wear it and tell people about it and share that information. I don't think that the conversation so much is on the consumer, but as, it's on the producer and the people who are creating those objects and monetizing off of them as somebody showing appreciation for that culture you're wearing it respectfully it's not like you're going to um edmonton folk fest wearing an indigenous headdress that's right. used in ceremony you're yeah. using um beautiful jewelry that people wear in everyday life and i think that's perfectly acceptable and i think a lot of artists are really trying to make it known that that is acceptable kind of like um the bee yellowtail that i was speaking about her site mentions that it's indigenous fashion for everybody within the global community just created by indigenous people so that we can source that from appropriate designers and creators i hope that yeah. helps a little i know it's such a tricky conversation when we're not too sure what we should be doing with these objects especially once we have them in our possession yeah yeah. All right. Is there anyone else that would wish to um, open their mic and <laughs> say something? <laughs> because I've given up looking at the chat. <laughs> I think uh, we have completed everybody. And I think um, we've uh, now got something else more to think about, Katya. And that's always a good thing when these sessions are put on so that we stimulate conversation and thought on these things. And um, this was a great, a great evening. I, so, I would like to add, uh, Slavka, that I know it can be difficult to want to talk about these things in person as well, but if anybody would like to, they can reach out to me through email, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions or continue talking about this with them too. Right. Oh, thank you so much. Um, and I will let the participants, um, I'll get them in touch with you. Thank you. All right, then. Thank, Thank you. you very much, everyone, uh, for taking part tonight, and I uh, hope to see you on the next one. Good night, all. Good night.
And I should have said from the first part, Christos Voskras, Vuisonovskras. 